Hi students and welcome to today's live IELTS class. My name is Adrian. I'm streaming to you from beautiful Central Europe. I hope everybody is having a fantastic weekend so far, staying strong and healthy and optimistic during some challenging times. Welcome, Muhammad. Good to see you. Constanta Prime Motivation. Love that name. All right, uh, everyone, this lesson is presented to you by aehelp.com for academic IELTS success. Visit us there for the general IELTS. Check us out at gieltshelp.com. That's generalieltshelp.com. On both of our websites, we have lots of materials to help you get those high bands. Uh, this is a speaking part three class, and I'm going to tell you about how to get that band nine the best way possible. Uh, welcome me here. Welcome to our members. Welcome our moderator, Carolina. Nice to have you all on board. Our websites look like this. This is our general IELTS website at gieltshelp.com. You can click that big red button to join our premium package. For the academic IELTS, it's the blue background. Click that big red button. It is a one-time payment for lifetime access, so it's really worth it. It's not a lot of money, and you get a lot of materials and strategies that help thousands of people every day uh, to get higher band scores, so definitely worth it. We are an IELTS registration center and uh, trained British Council agents. Um, yeah, you can practice your speaking for free. So uh, when you're logged into your My Student account, uh, and then, uh, you click on the uh, student partner speaking button in your My Student account. You can access this with our uh, free version of our course, the trial version as well. Uh, then you will get redirected um, to another page, and then you will always find people in here. So right now we have uh, Gus, we have Prathamesh, Masrur in here, um, waiting for somebody to video. Uh, audio chat with them so you can check that out all right so make sure you do that okay I'm gonna quickly close that before somebody pings me in hopes of getting a chat going during this live class okay everyone so uh, if you have questions email me adrian at aehelp.com and I will get back to you ASAP very importantly um, some important, important announcement today for our live class schedule. Uh, today we're doing speaking part three, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, no class. That's our usual. And then Wednesday, I will have one more class, speaking part one. And that's the last class that I'm hosting in Europe for some time. Now, um, we have set up an office here and we're still looking for somebody to do uh, European uh, live broadcasts as well. So. Uh, we'll have someone, but for now, I'm going back to West Coast Canada, um, and uh, it's going to take a couple of weeks to transition, especially with COVID. It's making it a little bit slower and more challenging. So between March 18th and, Mar and April 6th, there's no live classes, but we will be releasing new HD videos on the channel. So we've got a series of new videos that we're going to release that are going to be exciting, uh, including my official uh, IELTS exam experience. So those are going to be coming up, so make sure to check back. And then from April 7th, we're go I'm continuing the live classes uh, from Victoria, which is next to Vancouver, if somebody's not sure where that is. Um, and uh, the time will be uh, universal um, standardized time uh, four o'clock okay and it's going to be speaking a part one for everyone on the seventh and then uh, we'll have more on the eighth uh, ninth and so forth so make sure to uh, keep tuning in okay so we've got lots of content new exams coming for you um, and a big move for us so uh, there you go all right everyone uh, so we're going to get into uh, our speaking, okay, and um, make sure to speak, okay, so this is a speaking class, speak and repeat, 
All right, I just caught from the corner of my eye, Sieda Afzal says, I managed on getting an overall band uh, 8.0 on my first attempt. Thank you for your advice and help. Sieda, that's fantastic. Congratulations. Keep it up. Nice. Okay. So uh, we're doing part three today. Uh, just a little bit of background to part three. Your part three is connected to your part two. Okay. So we just covered a part two 30 minutes ago, and our part three will be um, a continuation of part two. So just for some warm up and for some practice, let's go through our part two answer, and then we'll get into our part three questions, okay? So here we go. The examiner says, your one minute preparation time is up. Uh, please begin speaking. Now, we're talking about a river, lake, or sea, or ocean that is important for your country's economy. And this is the answer that our members and I created last class. So here we go. Uh, let's do this together. This is speaking. Uh, make sure to speak. If you have to read a little bit, that's okay. Uh, but uh, say it loud, okay? Say it loud, all right? So the Arabian Sea is arguably the most important body of water for India's economy. This massive body of saline water is located in the northwestern part of India as part of the Indian Ocean and east of many Arabian countries such as KSA, Oman, and south of the country of Pakistan. It connects the ports of these Arabian and Asian nations across more than a million square kilometers of dark blue water filled with an abundance of sea life. Historically, stretching back thousands of years, the Arabian Sea had been used by Indian sailors for trade, exploration, and even warfare. Back in the early 2300s, Indian sailors discovered much of the Indian coast, navigating the trade winds of the Arabian Sea. They had brought with them fabrics such as silk and spices to trade with neighboring communities. Later, in the 17th century, this trade extended further across the sea to European countries for not only food and such amenities, but gold and people as well. The British Indian Trading Company um, was uh, using the sea frequently during this time and for centuries to come. During modern times, the Arabian uh, Sea still serves much the same purposes as it did throughout history, but... On a much grander scale, nowadays, hundreds of massive cargo ships leave the ports of India with millions of dollars worth of merchandise. Furthermore, the sea is a major food source for many countries for such luxuries as prawns and fish. The fishing industry of India nets billions of dollars from this valuable resource. Last but not least, it is a tourist hotspot for all kinds of water recreation, such as diving, surfing, and pleasure boating, which also brings in hundreds of millions of dollars annually. If I had to guess, I would say that it's roughly a third of India's economy uh, and is dependent on this Arabian Sea, uh, a major part of its gross domestic product. Okay, <clears throat> your time is up. Stop there. Now I'm going to uh, ask you a question or two related to your response and some questions connected to the topic of part two for part three. And then they'll ask a question uh, like this. When is the last time that you had visited the Arabian Sea? Okay, so it's uh, always what happens now with the speaking is the examiner will ask you a question that's specifically connected to your response. Okay, so Oas is saying, do you have any personal experience um, in the Arabian Sea? Exactly, Oas, notice how mine was very similar to your question. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly how it works. So here's my question. When is the last time that you had visited the Arabian Sea? Uh, notice the had, okay? Uh, sweet, sweet, I did see that comment that you got seven on your speaking. Congratulations. Okay, uh, give me an answer. So some of you who have visited, give me an answer. If you hadn't or haven't yet, that's also okay. Give me a nice full sentence answer for this follow-up question uh, to part two. When is the last time 
you had visited the Arabian Sea. Sook says, if memory serves me right, I had visited the sea two years ago. Uh, okay, give me some more information, Sook. Uh, Mihir says, it was two years ago when I had gone uh, sailing there. With who, Mihir? What were you doing? Give me a little bit more. Alpha says, about two years back, I went to Goa, which is on the western coast of India in the Arabian Sea, uh, for a wedding. Okay, very good, Alpha. So a little bit more detail. Okay. Prime motivation, same thing, more detail. Okay, notice how everybody's answering a little bit too short. Mahmoud says, I had visited the Arabian Sea after finishing my school when I went to Oman uh, for tourism purposes. That's much better, much more detail, more content, more vocabulary and grammar. Good job, Mahmoud. Okay. Asad Beck says, back three years ago, in order to chill out with friends, I had visited the Arabian Sea, and it was my last time there. I stayed there for about four or five days, um, just uh, swimming in the ocean and um, having some great food. Okay, Asad Beck, very good. Nice. Maybe a little bit more. Okay. So he says, in fact, I hadn't visited the Arabian Sea before, but I'm actually planning to go there with my family after this pandemic is over. That works. Okay, very good. Prathamesh says, I have visited the Arabian Sea four years ago with my family on uh, Kokon Beach for a vacation. Very good. So I had uh, visited the Arabian uh, Sea about four years back during the summer. Um, let's see. On uh, Kokon uh, Beach with my family for about uh, two weeks to enjoy some fun in the sun. Doing a bit of windsurfing and snorkeling. All right, details get you points. Vocabulary gets you points, okay? So uh, here we go. When is the last time you had visited, okay? Past perfect, the Arabian Sea. I had visited the Arabian Sea about four years back during the summer on Kokan Beach with my family for about two weeks to enjoy some fun in the sun, doing a bit of windsurfing and snorkeling. Very good, missed those days. Can't wait to have that back. Hopefully summer will be good for us all. Okay, good. So I see lots of great answers as well. Let's keep going. So now the examiner will say, okay, um, let's talk about trade and commerce. Why is it important for countries to trade goods and services with each other? Okay, so they have these sets of questions He's going to ask you the first one first, okay? So why is it important for countries to trade goods and services with each other? Clearly here you have to give an answer, an explanation as well, and really work hard to paraphrase uh, the words in the question. So paraphrase important countries, goods, trades, services. There are synonyms and other ways to say these words. Uh, so when you show paraphrasing accurately, your band score goes up. It shows more comprehension. It shows more communication. Okay. All right. So give me a nice full sentence answer. Okay. And again, paraphrase. Okay. So paraphrase key words in the questions. Um, for example, important, uh, you can say necessary, okay? Or vital, or essential, okay? Those are all good words for the word important, all right? While I'm waiting for your answers, 
Uh, let's see. Maybe my chat is stuck again. Sometimes that happens. Oh, no, oh, there it goes. All right. Kevin Bowie says, it is paramount for different economies to export and import because they can make up each other's deficits in terms of materials and amenities like developed nations selling tech products to developing uh, ones and later uh, supplementing the former with labor to keep the economy prospering. Also, the movement of products across uh, borders fosters uh, intercultural understanding and hence uh, global peace, okay? And hence creating a global community, yeah. Uh, Renal says trade uh, between countries is one of the most important aspects to increase globalization and it strengthens uh, political relationships. Renal, very nice, okay? Uh, a little bit more, right? At least uh, for these um, part three answers, you want to do at least like a full uh, 200 character comment in the chat. Okay. All right. Mihir says international transport allows countries to access a higher quality of goods at lower prices because it creates competition. Uh, this favors a capitalist attitude and also leads to a uh, fairer and more prosperous global community. Uh, Mihir, very good. Good start. I added a little bit to finish. Uh, what you're saying and to develop it further. Uh, students, when you hear me read your comment, try to copy me. If you don't catch it right away, it's okay because this class is recorded. So you can go back and then check later and practice listening and repeating. A uh, good way to catch it is the time. So Mihir knows that uh, I read his comment at around uh, 16 minutes and 10 seconds into the class. Uh, Ferdov says, nations fulfill their markets their needs with a variety of products collaborating with each other and in this way maximize economic development and growth. Very nice, Ferdov. I like it. Look at all those different answers. All very good. Okay. Rajveer says, it is essential for nations to import and export commodities and services uh, to each other. Uh, as some countries face shortages of certain products, uh, such as food and human resource. India imports kiwis from New Zealand to fulfill the local demands, as it is difficult to produce these indigenously. Very nice, Rajveer. I like how you rolled that example into it. So answer, explanation, example. Vaishnavi, well, a country should trade uh, to survive and network with other countries as some goods will be made in a particular country and to get those goods and services, uh, they need to import and export with each other. Okay, very good. I made some corrections, Vaishnavi. Pay attention to those. Alpha Forest says, trade and services are an integral part of the economy of any country. It plays a substantial role in the growth of the country and maintaining a supply route of essential goods. India imports the majority of crude oil from Iran via the Arabian Sea. Alpha Forest, beautiful connection to your part two response. I'm going to take it because that's what you want to do. Okay, so it is essential for nations across the globe to trade among each other as this leads to more prosperity for the average citizen by providing um, jobs, services, and goods that may otherwise be inaccessible in accessible um, most of India's oil is imported um, from Iran across the Arabian Sea and of course this is needed to operate the manufacturing 
industry of the country, which in turn produces roughly 25% of all consumer goods, such as clothes, which are exported worldwide. Okay. So uh, here we go. Yeah, very nice. Okay. And we want to make those connections to our part two response. So uh, here we go, everyone. Okay. Uh, why is it important for countries to trade goods and services with each other? Well, it's essential for nations across the globe to trade among each other as this leads to more prosperity for the average citizen by providing jobs, services, and goods that may otherwise be inaccessible. Most of India's oil is imported from Iran across the Arabian Sea. And of course, this is needed to operate the manufacturing industry of the country, which in turn produces roughly 25% of all consumer goods, such as clothes, which are exported worldwide. Okay, sure, that makes sense. So import, export, connecting to part two, right? And this is why we went through part two so that we can remember to use uh, part two for our connection to strengthen the coherence of our response. Okay, um, and here the examiner would probably not say, can you give some examples? Uh, they would probably say, can you give some more examples? Okay, so uh, the examiner will follow up and they want more detail, they want more fluidity, fluency, and so they'll say, can you give some more examples? Why? Because I already gave one example of the oil and the clothes, right? So can you give some more examples? Okay, I'm sure you can, I mean, trade among countries. Uh, Ferdov says, absolutely, take the USA and Saudi Arabia, the former one imports oil, and the latter one purchases electric cars like Tesla. As a result, people of these two nations are happy to be able to thrive. Yes, and for Dobbs, I'm sure you caught the irony there. Um, taking oil and then sending electric cars, oil, gas power engine, electric car to a country where there's lots of oil. Kind of funny, right? I'm, I'm not sure if you did that on purpose for Dobbs, but <laughs> it's good. <laughs> I like it. Um, oh, it says in Syria, there is a surplus of wheat, which uh, is exported to other countries such as Lebanon. Thousands of tons of this commodity is shipped to Lebanon. At the same time, um, Syria imports fruit because Lebanon uh, has uh, many orchards and farms that are producing fruit. Uh, they share borders and this makes uh, the trade um, easy. Okay, very good, Ois. Uh, Balbir says, well, India buys expensive petroleum products from uh, KSA and exports handmade products, spices, and vegetables across the Arabian Sea. Both countries uh, have an agreement, and this works well for the general population. Okay, very good, Balbir. So it's another example, okay? Prince Grabal says, for instance, various spices and raw materials for manufacturing are imported into India from countries such as, so Prince, more information, more information. Rashika says, sure, Sri Lanka has been exporting garments around the world while importing cheese from New Zealand. Yeah, it's amazing how much New Zealand produces for being such a fairly small country. Um, Mihir says, <clears throat> cheaper imports, particularly from countries such as China and Vietnam, have eased inflationary pressures in India. Okay, Mihir, a uh, little bit more, be more specific. So what kinds of goods from China? Um, so tertiary manufacturing. Okay. Uh, by the way, just so some of you know, um, there's three levels of industry. So primary industry. And we also call these primary products, secondary industry, okay, and tertiary industry. 
Okay, uh, primary industry is raw materials, okay? Like mining coal or iron, okay, or water or crude oil. A secondary industry is manufactured goods, okay? So pots and pans, toys and cars. Uh, tertiary industry, let me separate this with a semicolon so that it makes a bit more sense. Tertiary industry, you can probably guess, is the service industry. Like um, tourism and healthcare. Okay, um, and all of those are traded uh, with nations. So just giving you some more ideas of how you can kind of structure your ideas in this uh, type of pyramid uh, scheme, okay? All right, Hani says, for example, Egypt exports cotton to many countries across the globe. Another example is India has been exporting spices to the entire world. Okay, a uh, little bit more range of vocabulary, Hani. Good ideas. Uh, have more diversity in your word choice, okay? Vaishnavi says, certainly there are many examples to consider throughout the world, such as importing iron and steel. Some cars uh, export food and vegetable and spices to other countries. Okay, um, I'll give one as well, definitely. Canada is a country rich in natural resources and therefore it exports uh, lumber, coal, aluminum, and many other raw resources around the world. And in turn, Canadians import products from secondary industry, such as electronics from Japan and uh, clothing from Turkey. Okay, so uh, here we go. Uh, can you give some examples? Definitely. Canada is a country in, uh, rich in natural resources and therefore it ex exports lumber, coal, aluminum, and many other raw resources around the world. And in turn, Canadians import uh, products from secondary industries such as electronics, um, from Japan and clothing uh, from Turkey. Okay. Next question. So be creative, give details, be original. You don't have to give very difficult answers. You definitely want to be fluent. Okay. So practice and make sure you're speaking. Okay. Make sure you're speaking. Here's the next question. What are the advantages and disadvantages of importing products from other countries that are also available locally. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of importing goods that are also available locally? Oh, it says, actually trading some goods that exist in one's own country does have some negatives and positives, benefits and uh, negatives. Uh, the advantages can be increased competition, which leads to a decrease in prices for uh, the locals um, and allows citizens to try uh, other qualities of manufacturing. Okay, OS, and you still need to go to the negative. Alpha says, trading products available indigenously is mainly 
of foreign affairs strategy. It boosts the relationship and provides much bigger market for growth and expansion. Okay, Alpha, I get what you're saying. However, you're not clearly answering the question of whether it's positive or negative or how it's positive or negative. So you have to focus on that. Ferdov says, importing commodities which exist on the local market breaks down businesses that produce the same items. As a result, unemployment's rate increase and this trend can cause poverty and a stagnation in the economy, which I'm looking for the rest of it for Dobbs, but I don't see it. Um, but it's a great start for Dobbs. I think you're on to a very good point. Preeti says, importing goods from other countries not only builds a strong relationship between countries, but also gives uh, maybe a better quality and a cheaper price than local products. However, sometimes quality is compromised and it hurts the local businesses. Mm -hmm. Very good, Preeti. Can you give me an example? Okay. Rashika says the merit of importing products that are produced locally is that it will motivate the local retailers to produce goods of higher quality for people and the possibility of dropping prices. The negatives uh, is that local businesses uh, may go bankrupt. Rashika, bankrupt. <clears throat> yeah, so let's see some more answers here. Okay, Prince Graval says, the pros of this development is that it helps to create a good relationship with other countries, but on the other hand, importing such products which are available locally can be quite expensive and can damage the economy. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> NVY Gaming, you're a fan and you're looking for words for the topic project. Um, <clears throat> project could be an endeavor, an undertaking. Okay, lots of ways. It could be a business. So <clears throat> lots of ways to uh, paraphrase project. Definitely. All right. Um, let's see some more. Katarina Goncalves says, sometimes even if the product is available within the country, it's more expensive to produce, such as oil in 1970 in Brazil. And other times it's cheaper, uh, and the incentives for local businesses um, to make better products at cheaper prices. Okay, Katharina, you're, at a, you're uh, on the right track. Uh, you need to express yourself a little bit clearer, okay? Omair Aslam says, getting products from other countries that are available in one's own country uh, increases variety uh, and choices for local consumers, which is a positive. And the negative is that some products are very expensive and the local ones are cheaper. I'm not sure how that's a negative, Omar. You're so careful. You're going to have to explain that. <clears throat> okay. Rajveer says, the pros of importing goods that are available locally are quality and price, as it encourages competition, which enables manufacturers to provide the best products at competitive prices. The cons of this trend is that it can hurt local businesses and increase the monopoly of international players. Very nice use of vocabulary. Right. Okay. So um, the benefits of having international uh, choices for goods that are already on the local market is that this both gives a greater variety to consumers and it increases 
competition, thereby decreasing the cost of uh, products and ensuring better quality. However, the contra to this um, is that it can also lead to uh, bankruptcy for local vendors and unethical uh, labor and business practices as multinational uh, companies a search for cheap labor. Indeed, this type of commerce gives rise to uh, sweatshops in parts of Asia, Europe, and Africa. Okay. All right, um, so here we go. Uh, repeat after me. What are the advantages and disadvantages of importing products from other countries that are also available locally? The benefits of having international choices for goods that are already on the local market is that this both gives a greater variety. Oh, yep, well, that behind me right there is what's called the blue screen of death because the computer that's running this uh, projector uh, just died. <laughs> so, so that happened, uh, but not to worry. I will fire it up. Just give me one second and I will be back, okay? So just, uh, just a second here. Uh, it'll take me a moment to restart it. Uh, meanwhile, try to uh, repeat what I just said there. Uh, or what I just typed there on your own. That's a first. Not bad, actually. I think in three years, I believe that was the first time that the blue screen of death appeared. Um, okay, and there's a nice expression for you in English, the blue screen of death. All right, and I bet you, of course, because of Microsoft Word, that I most likely lost at least the last couple answers. Okay. All right. Just a moment. Okay. We'll be we'll get this back real quick. Not to worry. At least it'll give your brain a, a moment to relax a little bit. Take a two minute breather. All right. So uh, once I'm back in Canada, again, that's one of the nice things that's coming up is I will have a better studio there. So a little bit more powerful uh, system for sure, uh, running all of this. Um, so, there we go, okay. All right, well, let's see how much that we lost and how much is still there. Eh, it's pretty much all gone up until that save point, but that's okay, not to worry, I'll check those out after. Okay, um, so let's go to the next question. We'll do a couple more for sure, okay? Here we go. So trick, don't panic. It's the same thing in the aisles, okay? Never panic. If you don't know the answer uh, to a question, don't panic, all right? Uh, by the way, um, if you really don't understand a question in the IELTS exam, what should you do? So if, you, if the examiner asks you a question and you don't understand it, what should you do? 
Anybody? What's a good step? Okay. I'll give you a couple of tips for this because I often get asked this question. Okay. Anybody know? So here, if you don't understand a question, because that can happen in part three. Do not panic. Okay. Instead, ask for the question to be repeated. Okay. Don't freeze. Don't panic. Uh, don't freak out. Yeah, Rajvir says just ask them to repeat it. And all you need to say is, uh, I'm sorry. I spaced out a bit. Would you mind repeating that question? Um, so don't say I didn't understand it. Okay. Um, but just start with this one. Mm, I'm sorry. I spaced out a bit. Would you mind repeating that question? Okay, spaced out means that you weren't really paying attention. It's a nice idiom, okay? And uh, if you really don't understand it, so if they repeat the question and you still don't understand it, uh, then you should say, I don't really get what you are asking me. Could you... please ask me the next question. Okay, so this will affect your mark. Okay, you probably won't get a nine if you say this, um, but it's not as bad as giving a completely strange and off topic answer. Okay, so it, this it's still better than uh, just going completely off topic and the examiner going, what is this person talking about? So uh, that's the worst case scenario because you're wasting time and you're being incoherent, okay? So if you really don't get an answer, then just say, okay, I really don't get what you're asking me. Could you please ask me the next question? And then they will ask the next question, but really try to understand it before you do that, okay? So... Uh, they cannot paraphrase, they cannot give you extra help, they can just repeat the question once, okay? All right, so that's your strategy. First ask for the question to be repeated. Okay, so here is the next question for us. Um, answer this in as much of detail as possible. Uh, if trading among nations were to suddenly stop, how would this affect people's lives? Is this good or bad? Okay, so give me a nice full sentence answer for this one. If trading among nations were to suddenly stop, um, how would this affect people's lives? Is this good or is this bad? Okay. Ferdov says, if international trade suddenly ceased, People will be shocked and terrified as they will not find some goods in local stores and individuals will relate that with uh, the apocalypse and will behave uh, uncontrollably. Yeah, for dogs, you can say an anarchy uh, might break out, right? Anarchy. Uh, Kevin says, if international commerce was to seize at once, people's lives would be turned upside down. To be more specific, many businesses capitalizing on um, distributing foreign items would fold, causing massive job cutbacks. And if trade breaks down indefinitely, there might be rampant famine as not all nations are self-sufficient of their provisions. Um, very good, Kevin. Yeah, absolutely. So we would definitely... Uh, be in a world of trouble. No pun intended, right? A world of trouble. Um, Asad Beck says, I can't even imagine how much it will devastate all countries. Um, forbidding of imports among countries will definitely impact the economy of all people. Like during quarantine, many countries are uh, trading in lower quantities, and this can be uh, seen in the availability of goods in stores. Um, in my country, we haven't seen uh, bananas for the last two months. It's not true, but I'm <laughs> just giving you an example. Okay. Mihir says, stopping international trade 
would have severe consequences such as inflation and unemployment, which would directly hit the economy. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, so if commerce among nations were to uh, suddenly cease, it would devastate the world economy and would likely lead to strife and uh, conflict as many countries are heavily reliant on the imports of a certain uh, goods such as uh, foods including rice and wheat so this would uh, rapidly lead to anarchy and chaos it would likely put human civilization back in the dark ages this is why imposing trade embargoes as punishment is very severe okay um, so here we go. I'm sharing, obviously, a lot of vocabulary with you as well here. So if you're not sure what a word means, write it down. Check the definition after the class. And once you have the definition, then create an example sentence. Okay. All right. So here we go. Uh, repeat after me. If trading among nations were to suddenly stop, how would this affect people's lives? Is this good or bad? Well, if commerce among nations were to suddenly cease, it would devastate the world economy and would likely lead to strife and conflict as many countries are heavily reliant on the imports of certain goods, such as foods, including rice and wheat. So this would rapidly lead to anarchy and chaos. It would likely put human civilization back in the dark ages. This is why imposing trade embargoes as punishment is very severe. Okay. Trade embargoes basically means to stop a nation from being able to trade um, certain goods or uh, commodities with other nations. Okay. So if you're doing a good job and you're being really fluent, the examiner will ask you some more questions. They may even introduce another related uh, topic to part two, like let's talk about product and service delivery. Okay. So trade, obviously very tightly connected with product and service delivery. Um, what are the most common ways that products and services are delivered to customers? Uh, give me a nice answer for this one. So what are the most common ways that products and services are delivered to customers? So kind of switching gears here. Keep your mind dynamic and open, so be ready for the examiner to kind of shift gears and ask you different questions, okay? Oh, it says there are many methods to transit goods to customers such as truck, um, picking them up in person or uh, sending them online through the mail. I received a book purchased from Amazon in my mailbox. Very good, OS. I made a few corrections there. Hopefully you took Note of that, Kevin says, the most popular method of product delivery today are uh, customers picking up orders from sites or goods being sent to their doorsteps via postal services. Apparently, modern people uh, champion convenience, so they tend to opt for the later option. I actually made quite a lot of purchases which were shipped to my house during the pandemic. Yeah, and Amazon being a very good example of that, right, Kevin? Nadia says, uh, yes, it happened during the COVID pandemic. All trade uh, broke down. Lots of businesses collapsed. Okay, yeah, that's for the previous one, Nadia. It's a good answer. Okay. 
All right. Um, so the frequent methods methods of getting products to shoppers is via uh, rail, uh, car, or truck, boat, and uh, plane. Often, uh, especially nowadays with the lockdown, uh, people are ordering much of their consumer goods online through major retailers like Amazon like Amazon and having um, their purchases delivered right to their uh, doorstep from anywhere in the world. I just got a new laptop uh, from Japan in this way last week. Okay. Uh, which is obviously not true, because if it were, I wouldn't have had the blue screen of death. And if I did, then I should probably send my laptop back. But no, this old girl, she's been um, pulling her weight for the last, oh, I'd say six years. So maybe time for a new laptop. Anyway, um, <clears throat> here we go. Uh, read and repeat with me. If you can, then don't read, just repeat. So what are the most common ways that products and services are delivered to customers the frequent methods of getting products to shoppers is via rail, truck, boat, and plane. Often, especially nowadays with the lockdown, people are ordering much of their consumer goods online through major retailers like Amazon and having their purchases delivered right to their doorsteps from anywhere in the world. I just got a new laptop from Japan in this way last week. Okay, so now the examiner will continue and they'll ask you more questions. What is the best way? and so on, a couple more questions there. Uh, the idea is to keep giving answers, explanations, and examples throughout your responses, and be original, give details, but don't overcomplicate, and don't keep speaking until uh, the examiner stops you. This is a weird trend that I see is resurfacing, where um, it, I saw it a, like a year ago or a couple years ago, uh, where people had this idea to just keep talking until the examiner stops them. And then it kind of disappeared. People realized that was not a good strategy. And now it's resurfacing again. So these, some, for some reason, some bad um, techniques uh, kind of go away and then come back again. Uh, speaking until the examiner stops you is one of these bad strategies. Uh, don't do that, okay? So you should definitely have an end to your... Uh, ideas in your sentence. If you see the examiner is kind of getting antsy, itchy, they're looking at their paper, stop talking, okay? Um, all right, that's just a tip. It's just because I've seen more of that happening these days than usual, this continuing to talk, okay? Uh, don't do that. All right, everyone, so that's it for now for today. I will have one more class out of Europe um, on Wednesday, so make sure you tune in for that. That will be the last class for me in Europe anyways. We'll probably have some more European sessions in the future, but with other teachers. Uh, I'm going to be um, doing my live classes from West Coast Canada from April, So, uh, but be here Wednesday for that finale. Okay, everyone, um, make sure to check us out at ahelp.com for academic IELTS and uh, gltshelp.com for uh, general IELTS. Vaishnavi, I'm glad you had some great practice today. Thank you, Carolina, for moderating. That was fantastic. See you Wednesday, me here. Have a great weekend as well, Eugene. Bye, everyone. Much love to all of you from Europe. Bye for now.